All right, folks, let's dive into this chapter then. So we're up to chapter two of the book by Bishop, American Zombie Gothic. And, <laughs> you know, again, if you're having a, a bit of a struggle with this book, you know, don't, don't be concerned about that. Don't feel bad. Uh, it is quite challenging. Uh, and you don't necessarily need to understand every word in the chapter, every theory, every concept. That, that's not the point. Uh, mainly what I want you to do here and what we'll try to do uh, in this lecture is pull out some of the main themes, some of the important concepts that we'll need going forward. But I also want you to get a pretty good taste of uh, the flavor of this writing style because it is, you know, uh, whether fortunate or unfortunate, you could tell me what you think about that. But this is pretty much how uh, academic writing looks, you know, at the graduate level, uh, especially once you get into a, a master's degree program, a graduate program, PhD level. Uh, this is how academics, you know, PhDs and uh, graduate students tend to uh, write and you know, talk to each other. If you go to an academic conference, you know, it's the same thing. Uh, so <laughs> I guess uh, you know, my first uh, impression of writing like this, you know, I don't know if, I, if I mentioned this before, I'm sorry if it's uh, repetitive, but I just remember the first time I saw this stuff, I just thought, wow, <laughs> absolute gibberish on a page, uh, horrible writing, uh, you know, how can anybody be fooled by this? Clearly, that's just a bunch of uh, random words. And I actually compared it to the, uh, if you ever watched Star Trek, uh, which I'm a big fan of that series, as well as uh, The Walking Dead. Uh, but the uh, there's something in Star Trek they call techno babble. Okay. And uh, what techno babble is, obviously, when you're writing a science fiction show, it's set in the far future. I think, you know, at least 200 years, I forget however many. Uh, anyway, <laughs> a long time from now, uh, we'll have spaceships and we're going to have all these advanced technologies, devices, be going to other planets, all that good stuff. Uh, but what happens is you have to be able to, uh, you know, have characters talking about some device that doesn't exist yet because it hasn't been invented yet and it might not be invented for a hundred years. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's in the story, so you need to uh, have the characters talk about it. Uh, so what they do, these writers, they uh, just put words together that sound scientific. You know, so maybe you got some device that goes back and forth in time or whatever. So it's like, let's, well, let's just throw the word quantum in there because that sounds very, you know, hip, <laughs> technological. Let's throw neuron in there. Why not put the word vortex in there somehow? Let's talk about transmogrification. Uh, let's throw the word uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg in the mix, you know. <laughs> so, you know, by the time you get um, put all these words together, you know, you got this character going around saying, "Oh, we need to, you know, gyrate the. Uh, we need to gyrate the optimal settings on the transmogrifying mirror neuron before the Heisenberg." You know, you get the idea. <laughs> now, my point is really that doesn't mean anything. It just sounds good, you know. Or it sounds uh, like something that would you might expect scientists of the future to be talking like that. So it comes, you know, it seems believable enough, I suppose, that most people nod along with it and say, well, there must be, you know, something here. I guess they're talking sense. I don't understand it, but, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, it seems uh, plausible. And so sometimes it can seem like you're reading techno babble, you know, frankly, and you start to wonder, is this stuff just, uh, you know, <laughs> has nobody re realized? <laughs> That it's just gibberish on this page. It's just techno babble. Doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, so there is a temptation to make that kind of assumption. But uh, you know, all I can I don't know what to tell you other than I, I've been there, and it took me a long time to realize that no, actually, there's <laughs> you know quite a bit of meaning here. It's just that the jargon and the uh, the referring to books and theories and you know other books that I haven't read and you know, shortcuts and uh, it just, <laughs> basically what I'm saying is not, might, what seems like techno babble now, uh, or bad writing now, uh, eventually will start to make more sense as you get more familiar with the discourse. So try not to get too discouraged. Uh, I'm not going to say it ever gets crystal clear. You know, I, I think that's would be t a total lie if I said that. <laughs> uh, but it gets better. I feel comfortable saying that. Anyway, with that little disclaimer out of the way, uh, let's talk about some of the stuff we can get out of this chapter. Now, he talks about two movies in here 
and they're both free. You can watch them both. Uh, I felt like we didn't have enough time to cover both of the movies. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the other one. I think it's called I Walked With the I Walked With a Zombie. Great. It's a better film, I think, than White Zombie, uh, especially if you like Jane Eyre, you know, sort of classical, uh, you know, classic literature. Yeah, you'd probably really enjoy that uh, story or that movie, so you could watch that and write about it for one of your essays if you want. Uh, but here I want to talk about White Zombie because it is the first, you know, as we'll see, it's an important movie just for being the first zombie uh, film. And it's so different than the zombies we get in later movies. And plus it has Bela Lugosi in it. <laughs> He's just one, one of my favorite actors. Uh, a little bit campy, sure, but I just enjoy. I really love his uh, performances. And also like the use of sound effects in the movie. So I don't really have this in the PowerPoint anywhere, but it's, it's one of the first movies that had sound. You know, before this, it'd just be a silent movie, you know, with the captions up there and some, maybe some music playing on a record player. <laughs> so, uh, but this this actually had sound effects. It was like a big deal. To, oh, my God, it's got sound effects. Uh, so when you watch the movie, you might be struck by, you know, well, there's a scene with this loud ratcheting sound going in the mill. You know, you, they, it's kind of this loud, irritating noise, perhaps, but... Uh, what you don't realize is at the time you would have been like whoa you know it's, it's amazing i can actually hear that mill turning you know and i can hear this you know whatever's going on the wind the birds uh, <laughs> you know that would have been impressive kind of kind of like uh you know i don't know like 3d used to be you're going to an I imax theater or something like that you know sort of a wow factor in terms of uh, special effects <laughs> kind of cool from that perspective as well uh, okay, so we'll talk here about uh, some of these movies. I guess I've already started doing that. Uh, we want to get into this concept of the post-colonialism, a little bit about Hegel and this master-slave uh, master dialectic. It's uh, pretty weird. And then we'll get into Spivak and her essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? And again, I realize you're not, this is not of a you know, graduate level seminar. I think you'd almost need to be in a PhD level seminar to really delve deeply into things like Hegel uh, or at least a you know advanced philosophy class for the Hegel, uh, the Spivak, as well because of course she's uh, you know talking about Hegel in, in her essay, and <laughs> so you at least have to be at that level, <laughs> and then beyond to all the you know modern stuff that she's talking about. But but anyway, here's kind of what this is my really quick, very quick and dirty uh, take on this stuff, and I'm probably just butchering the hell out of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, hope, I hope to God no philosopher ever looks at these uh, my simplifications. But this is, I'm just trying to, you know, put something here that uh, will make sense to you um, and to me, for that matter. Uh, but anyway, this master-slave dialectic is kind of interesting when you're thinking about white zombie because there is l a literal sort of slavery going on. It's not slavery uh, as in something like Roots or, or you know America Civil War slavery. Uh, or pre, uh, you know, the slavery in America before the Civil War. It's not that kind of slavery. It's more like a, uh, I guess, magic is at play here. Um, technically, they, it's, it's the voodoo, uh, voodoo priest, voodoo master using the powder. And you'll see when you watch the movie. Um, but it's, it's instead of being a sort of zombies that, run, that walk around and, and bite people and try to eat people, they're sort of mindless uh, beasts, really. Uh, in this movie, they are basically slaves. You know, they, they just do whatever the uh, uh, voodoo priest tells them to do. So it's, it's a different kind of slave. And I think that is why Bishop wants to talk about Hegel here. Uh, because it, it does kind of shine some light on what some of the tensions, I guess, going on in the, in the movie. And why, when you watch this, <laughs> you probably think uh, that something is obviously not right here. Uh, uh, murder, Legendre, or Legendre, however you say that, the Bela Lugosi's character, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the voodoo priest, um, you don't feel good about what he's doing, right? It's like he's clearly doing evil things by zombifying people. Uh, but yet, you know, at the same time, you can tell it's not really good for him either. You know, maybe you almost sympathize a little bit with him because... Uh, you know, he's not getting a good result out of this either. It's really this, the whole zombification thing, it's bad for everybody involved. <laughs> you know, just because you're the one doing the zombie fight, 
uh, doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, that it's all good for you either. You know, this, the system, the zombification system is bad uh, in and of itself. And I think at that point is where we can start getting into Hegel. Uh, so Hegel, uh, you know, he's got this book, Phenomenology of Spirit, and you know, this big, massive, impenetrable tome, uh, you know, the terror of many a uh, aspiring philosophy student, or perhaps the joy, you know, <laughs> some people actually enjoy that stuff. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, there's a story in there, it's a couple pages, and a lot of people talk about it, called The Master-Slave Dialectic, and this is my sort of translation of it. So you've got these, this is the metaphor or analogy that Hegel talks about in those pages. He used the different words than this. This is just sort of my take. Uh, so you got this isolated, self-conscious being out there somewhere that, that thinks it is God. Right? So I don't. I think that I am the master of all I survey. Right? There's, you know, all powerful. I'm, I'm the, you know, all there is basically. Uh, we're the only being that's self-conscious or aware or sentient. Uh, but then this being uh, comes across another being. All right, and you. You could imagine this sort of God walking around, or this person that thinks he's a God, or she's a God, uh, or they're a God, whatever, uh, walking around and seeing other, you know, some other being, you know, looks a lot like them, and, you know, they start watching and they think, hmm, this person, or whatever this is, seems to be self-conscious too. Uh, you know, what's going on? Uh, so for Hegel, this is a, makes them both feel very threatened. You know, it's like, a, you know, this, this one God thought, or this this God thought he was God, and now there's another God-like you know thing out there. And you're like, oh, well, we can't both be God. <laughs> uh, we can't both be uh, all powerful or whatever. Uh, so what are we going to do about this? Uh, so let's let's have a fight. You know, we'll try to kill each other. Uh, and whoever doesn't die, you know, that person must be the must be God, right? Because otherwise you would you would be defeated. Um, again butchering this but that's <laughs> it's okay <laughs> uh, so uh, the one being whoever wins the fight basically instead of killing that other being uh, they just sort of beat them literally into submission uh, so this other being says look stop you know i'll do whatever you say i'll say if you you want if you want to feel like you're if you want me to say you're god i'll say you're god right you i cry uncle <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sort of scenario. So you got this one being is now the master. This other being is is the slave because they lost the f uh, fight and now they have to do, you know, whatever this uh, the other one tells them to do. Uh, so this is where it goes weird. Not that this whole thing hasn't been weird, but but, but anyway, moving on a little bit. Uh, so the loser, you know, realizes okay, I lost that fight, so I can't be God because I lost. So that leads to some like introspection and some realizations that, hey, you know, maybe I'm not God. Maybe uh, that's not what existence is all about, right? They, they basically start becoming more and more enlightened uh, as a result of losing. You know, they realize it's, this is kind of a delusion I was under before. You know, there are other people out there. Uh, there's other self-conscious beings out there. Um, so basically, they, they reach this point of enlightenment as a result of losing, whereas the winner is actually kind of at a disadvantage because they, they won, so they can continue their delusion. Um, uh, however, it's ultimately not fulfilling, right? Because it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's not true. <laughs> they're really not God. Uh, they don't really have, a, they're not really the only self-conscious being. And uh, so what's happening is they start to, um, or I guess the only way they can sort of cope is if they can, by telling this uh, slave what to do and hoping that the slave will sort of reaffirm or reassure them that they are, in fact, God. But the problem is they know, I think, deep down that they're just doing, they're telling that slave to do that. Right? It's not the slave doing it of their own accord. It's, uh, you don't know that it's, um, you know, I guess it's kind of like those movies where, uh, if there's a love potion, let's say, and somebody uses the love potion to uh, get married or to find love, right, with this love potion, but afterward you're never quite sure, does this person really love me or was it just the love potion? 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like you can never really be sure. So you're always kind of looking for that extra, uh, extra evidence, or you're, you're just always a little bit insecure, I suppose. Uh, so it doesn't quite work, ever really uh, work out. And I think it's something similar going on here with this, you know, master and slave uh, dialectic. You sort of need the, uh, they sort of need each other, but the, uh, in some ways, the master, quote unquote, is in a, even less enlightened than the, uh, the slave in this scenario. Now for Hegel, what needs to happen is they both need to realize that they are mutually dependent. They both are self-conscious beings. That's okay. You know, they recognize uh, uh, that they need each other. And then, and then there's a circuit that opens, you know, one, it's a reciprocal relationship. You know, so they're, you know, there's not a master and slave anymore. There's just two uh, beings that recognize each other's, uh, you know, self-consciousness. <laughs> So, again, I have no idea if that's even accurate, but that's what I, that's how I understood it. Now, Fanon, uh, Fritz Fanon comes along, and he's a, you know, pretty important figure in terms of racial studies. Um, and he uh, says this is kind of wonky, this whole scenario that Hegel talks about. And I think Fanon's probably right. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> you probably were, too. Uh, because really, if you think about this master and slave, it's not like the master cares about the slave recognizing him uh, or her, I guess, uh, in the scenario, right? They don't really want recognition at all. They just want this slave to, to work, right? To turn uh, things into things for them to enjoy. Uh, and the slave, on the other hand, doesn't really want any kind of mutual uh, respect or mutual uh, Con, you know, recognition either. They, they just want, you know, if they had their way, they would like to become the master and take on that role for themselves, right? And they, he mentions a few people like uh, Edward Said who talk about this in these, these, these uh, former colonies in India, let's say, where the, uh, even after the colonial powers leave, uh, the, uh, you know, the people that are left behind there will replicate the same sorts of uh, hierarchies and the same structures, and sometimes it's even worse. And Bishop says this is, if you, uh, in White Zombie, this is exactly what happens, right? The, um, you know, the colonial powers are gone, but now you've got murder Legendre in charge <laughs> uh, using zombification, which was, is even a more horrific way to uh, subjugate people than the, uh, you know, I guess the uh, 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 Britain, I suppose, whoever was running this colony in, in Haiti at the time uh, uh, was implementing, right? This is worse even though the, you know, the masters are, have left, but the new, the new boss, <laughs> meet the new boss, same as the old boss, <laughs> but maybe now the new, meet the new boss worse uh, than the old boss, right? Because the zombies, you know, they're, they're sort of even worse off, I guess, the, than slaves because they have no self-consciousness. There's nothing really going on mentally right there. They can't choose, like a, I guess a slave could choose to say, I'm not going to do that. You know, you, you can whip me or whatever, but kill me. I'm still not going to do it. And so you still have a little bit of autonomy that way, uh, whereas the, the zombie doesn't even have that, right? So, much, you know, much less a desire for liberation. And so this, you know, starts to make sense to me. I can see why Bishop would want to talk about some of these, some of these theories. Uh, and then Spivak, uh, she's got an essay called Can the Subaltern Speak? And again, it's one of these essays you could read it 50 times and have no clue what, what it's about. <laughs> uh, simple, uh, to put it simply and probably to butcher it at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's again, it's about imperialism. You know, again, all these countries and so India is a good example. Uh, it was run by the little Raj. You know, so these foreign powers come in, take over the government, set themselves up as elites for a while, and then the, there's a revolution or whatever. They leave, and then the a new government is formed, and a lot of times what happens is that, again, the new government, you, you think it would be better than, you know, what existed under the power while you were, you know, being uh, colonized. Uh, but again, what happens sometimes, it actually ends up worse. You actually end up worse off than you were before. Uh, so that's one of the themes here. I mean, this uh, all of these writings, you know, this, the idea here is the colonialism is, the imperialism is really horrible for everybody involved. Uh, it's like the, the great evil, the devil term, I guess, as Kenneth Burke would put it. 
And so here in a Spivak's essay, she's talking about the subaltern. And usually that word means something like a subordinate officer, like a junior officer in the army, let's say. Uh, but she means a whole class of people, a group of people who, um, you know, in the social hierarchy, so let's say you got the elites on top, and then maybe, you know, level below those, like working class, let's say. And then there'll be these tiers even below that. Um, and these uh, sort of low tiers are called the subaltern, subaltern class. And they're silent, invisible, irrelevant uh, to the levels above it. Uh, so they're marginalized not just by the colonial powers, but their own people, like the indigenous people. Uh, so they're like two or three steps removed from the, you know, the, uh, the reins of power, I guess, or the seat of power. And she says the subalterns may be spoken for or spoken about by elites, you know, such as academics, ethnographers, etc. Uh, but they have no power to make their own voices heard by these elites, right? So these are the uh, voices, or these are the people that you might read about in a textbook, you know, where you've had some so-called expert, you know, go in and study these people, uh, write up these reports, and, you know, you, you sort of read everything through their perspective, but you don't actually get to hear anything from the people themselves, right? They are just kind of ignored or, uh, again, assumed to be irrelevant somehow, not, not included in the story of history, and sort of left out. Uh, and so that's kind of what we mean, what she's talking about. There's can we even, can the subaltern speak? But one way to think about it is can we, can we hear them? Or do, we, do we see them anywhere? You know, we're trying to learn more about them, perhaps, but even if you do, uh, you might have a hard time getting, uh, you know, to be able to hear them, right? Yeah, and we can connect this to zombies, this concept. So essentially, this is from uh, Bishop here. Essentially, then, the creation and misuse of zombies is the perfect realization of the imperialist hegemonic model. So remember, we've been talking about hegemony quite a bit lately, and so now. So those in power, the hegemon, or rather those who have power, such as a voodoo priest, can enslave and conquer others. Those others literally lose their language, as well as their autonomy, and become the ultimate iteration of a slave. And so what Bishop, I think, kind of works both ways here. Um, on the one hand, Spivak and Hegel and Fanon I, and, you know, all the scholars he, uh, Bishop mentions here, they kind of help us understand zombies. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's the zombies kind of help us understand these theories a little bit better, right? Because it's kind of like the literal, you know, if you, if you apply what Spivak and Hegel and Fanon are saying literally you'd end up with uh, you know a story like we see in, in White Zombie where the hegemon you know in this case uh, murder Legendre, Bela Lugosi um, you know he can control people completely right you don't even need the you know, uh, you know you can't talk back you can't resist because you don't have any autonomy uh, to do so and even if you had that, you couldn't speak. You know, you got no power of language, no, um, you know, basically no ability to do anything other than what you're commanded to do. So this is, I guess, sort of the worst case <laughs> scenario, uh, literally, you know, of all these, uh, of like the neo-Marxism uh, or, the, or the feminist perspectives. You know, if we sort of took the stuff they're warning us about and sort of extrapolated, extrapolated and exaggerated that, you know, this is what we would end up with, and I, I think it's probably safe to say that the, you know, especially like those sub subaltern people, uh, that Spivak was talking about, uh, they probably do feel just like this, and like this is what it's like. Uh, all right, white zombie, um, we've talked about a little bit about this already, so just to wrap up here, so it is the first featured length treatment of zombies, so it's got a historical significance that way. And remember earlier, Bishop said that the zombies are the only sort of Hollywood monster that went directly from folklore, just boom, jump, jumped right into film. And so it didn't go through that lengthy uh, period of uh, you know, literature, stories, songs, plays, you know, straight to, uh, to film. And so that's kind of interesting why that monster is the first one to do that, or the only one to do that, is a good question. And two, 
you know, the fact that this is set in Haiti and it's got all this post-colonial stuff going on, you know, the plantation lifestyle or plantation uh, hegemony, I guess is probably the good word to use in that, describe that, is sort of in the scene. Uh, so you can see what all this is pretty good representation of that. And ho hopefully when you watch this, it will make you sort of uncomfortable and because it is... You know, it's you could say it's a product of its time, or you could say this is a you know, pretty good uh, example of those preferred readings uh, we've been we've been talking about. Uh, okay, so according to Bishop, this film exploits rumors about voodoo, and so the, he's saying I guess it's sort of based in the some of these ethnographers we were talking uh, talked about, but it doesn't portray it in uh, the way that uh, Bishop talks about as sort of a way to resist hegemony. You know, it was a synthesis of a Catholicism and, I guess, tradition, more older traditions or different traditions. Uh, instead, it's just kind of like going on these sort of rumors and uh, uh, what people think they know about voodoo. Basically bad information, right? Um, also, says it enforces racial dichotomies. Uh, so this sort of idea of races being opposites. It's just Dichotomy just kind of means you're saying something is the opposite of something else. That's usually erroneous thinking, and it certainly is here. Uh, so it enforces racial dichotomies by portraying white whites as good and, and blacks as potentially bad. And so we, you can see that in the film. And then uh, mirrors colonial stereotypes and imperialist hegemony. Right, again, so he's been talking before about how the people feel guilty. They sort of repress their guilt uh, especially in America, towards these uh, you know, the horrible stuff basically we did over there. You know, we talked about the Marine uh, invasion. I forget the year off, right off the top of my head, but you know, this is not just fiction. You know, a lot of the stuff is, is in the history books. You could read about it. So it's probably not going to be on page one. You know, it's probably be buried somewhere in the history books. Not something that <laughs> we're proud of. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think Bishop is kind of right. We'd rather forget about this stuff, but. You know, of course, it's always sort of like a, like Freud would say, you know, you got these repressed memories, but they keep sort of uh, manifesting themselves in various ways in nightmares or, in, in this case, in a horror film, right? These sort of repressed memories sort of come back in an altered form to, uh, you know, because we're feeling this sort of repressed guilt. And so we could say this, what's happening in a white zombie. So it establishes another link in the long chain of perceived Western superiority in terms of economics, politics, religion, and race. And so this this stuff might stand out to you, or you might get kind of caught up in the storyline, not notice it so much. Uh, but as you're watching it, do pay attention to like who are the characters, who are the models, who are the anti-models, who is uh, you know being portrayed as positive, good, uh, who's portrayed as bad or, or weak or vulnerable, you know, and how is that tied to, to race, uh, religion. Uh, Politics, I don't know if they really, <laughs> I'd have to think about that one, but, but certainly economics, like who's the rich characters, who's the poor characters, and that will, you know, give you some insights uh, into some of these theories, uh, as well as Bishop. Okay, so as you watch White Zombie, um, or just if you haven't seen the movie yet, just think about the voodoo zombies that Bishop talked about earlier. And so I wanna, just think about those zombies in films like White Zombie, the voodoo zombie, and compare it to the ones in The Walking Dead. Uh, specifically, what do you think they have to say? What are the differences there in terms of this master-slave elite subaltern dialectic? Uh, so you think it's, do you think it's the same, or do you think there's something else going on? Uh, so I guess you could think about it this way. So if the white zombie movie is kind of getting at these repressed, repressed guilt over the... Uh, American occupation of Haiti, let's say, this, this sort of uh, imperialism, the, the colonies, um, you know, that, that sort of stuff. Uh, what about Walking Dead? Because here the zombies aren't really under the control of a voodoo master, right? They're sort of off doing their, their own thing. And so we wanted to go back and look to see, well, does The Walking Dead then, you know, how does, what does it say about subalterns and uh, you know, this this master-slave dialectic, is it entirely different? <laughs> now, now I'm looking at this question, I'm thinking, this is probably uh, way too tough of a question to be asking you. 
And so let's maybe simplify it just a little bit. Um, if we go back and look here, yeah, maybe let's let's pick it up here with this this master slave dialectic again. But think about like a a, a, a human or su let's say survivor zombie <laughs> a dialectic. And so what does it mean to see a zombie? You know, when you when a you come across a zombie in The Walking Dead, uh, how does that you know, do you feel like the zombie is a self-conscious, self-aware being? Uh, in which case, you know, you'd probably act a certain way towards it. Uh, or you feel like it's sort of this mindless, you know, thing. Uh, doesn't have uh, self-consciousness. Doesn't have uh, power. Okay? Is that starting to make sense? So think about those two kind of zombies. The one zombie where you've used some kind of powder, probably not you, but, you know, the zombie priest or, who, or uh, the zombie master has applied the powder to sort of take control, mental brainwash, hypnotize, I guess, somebody into doing uh, their bidding uh, versus The Walking Dead where you're not really telling these uh, zombies what to do. Uh, how does that affect this master-slave story we've been talking about? Or does it not apply at all? So I don't know what you're going to do with that question. I'm kind of curious. So I'll just throw it out there, see what you can do with it, <laughs> see what sticks. <laughs> Maybe you can just produce some techno babble. Uh, anything is good at this point. Uh, all right. Uh, again, I you know I realize this is tough reading, so hopefully you'll stick at it or stick to it. Try to get at least something out of it. Try to get the gist out of it. Or at the very least, it's a pretty good heads up about what's coming as you get on into uh, graduate level uh, courses. Uh, but anyway, I'll leave it here. If you got questions, comments, love to hear those, or love to read those, rather, and I'll see you next time.